the demoralization of the American man, I think is just a fruit of the fact that we, we removed our roots from being a God-fearing society a long time ago. Welcome to the Mountain Tough Podcast, brought to you by Sig Sauer. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Mountain Tough Podcast. I am Dustin Diefender for CEO and host, and I'm so glad that you are here. We love seeing you dive into these episodes week after week, and it is our goal every single show, every single episode to bring you an inspiring, action-packed guest that helps you transform your life, that helps you level up, that helps you add those mental tools to your mental fitness toolbox so that you can stay dangerous, so that you can be always ready, so that you can truly live that abundant life and achieve your goals. If you are a new or a loyal listener, and if you have a second and you have not done so already, if you could take a minute and leave us a ranking or review on the show, those mean the world to me. I am a big believer of iron sharpens iron. Love seeing your feedback, love seeing your recommendations on guests, and with the algorithm, the rankings and reviews additionally allow these episodes to get out to more people and transform more lives. Shifting over to today's guest, on the show today, we have Pastor Joby Martin from the Church of 1122. He's down in Jacksonville, Florida. I got to know about Joby nine or ten months ago through Kyle Thompson at Undaunted Life, and we're going to dive into the current state spiritually of American men, and he's going to go through some powerful, powerful topics, particularly around spiritual warfare and what it is doing to demoralize men in 24 and 25 across the nation. A powerful, powerful conversation, so stand by for my discussion with Pastor Joby Martin. I can't believe I get to do this, quite honestly, and that, <laughs> you know, my church puts up with me, but I've just pre-decided there's a day I'm going to have to stand before the Lord and give an account of mm. how I led this church and did I preach his word or not, you know? And I just refuse to have that conversation and be like, well, I was too afraid of what people thought about this, or I didn't know if this part was going to work or so mm -hmm. just from the beginning, we were like, screw it. I'm just going to trust the word of God and let him, he'll just deal with all the consequences of it. So I don't know. I may be in jail for hate speech one day, but I promise you do a lot of good ministry from jail. See Paul, Yeah. but <laughs> I'm just going to unashamedly preach the word of God and it's interesting. We, uh, I think church, man, for the last like 50 years, well, I'll say it this way. There are shirts and there are blouses. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. like my wife, look, if I come home and she's got on one of my flannels, she looks great. If she's got on a girl shirt, she looks great. If I wear my shirt, I'm whatever. I look like I look, but if I wear a blouse, there's a problem. <laughs> And the church has been like a woman's blouse for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And really, women have been holding it down since the empty tomb. I mean, seriously, the backbone of church has been some like praying mamas and grandmamas. And so I for sure have the men in our church in mind when I'm preaching and teaching. And because when men lead and love well, everybody flourishes. And so mm -hmm. um, it's not like a strategy or anything. I just think it's actually the way God designed it. Like when it all hit the fan in Genesis in the garden, God went to the man and was like, hey, bro, what's up? And so that's mm -hmm. just kind of how we lead. And so to know a guy like you is listening makes perfect sense because, you know, our our church isn't only hunters, but I also just preach from, you know, my own experience too. Yeah. And so there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of hunting talks, especially right now, deer season opened here last weekend, so. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll I'll sit write all of my sermons from a tree stand. So every Monday I'm in the woods, spending time with the Lord, trying to write a sermon. That's incredible. Well, let's dive right into it because right. that that hit the 
topic that I wanted to get into a little bit because I I talked to Yako Buyans last week and he's got the JBM Ministries and 30 years of fighting the human trafficking fight and the intelligence side, the rescue side, the rehabilitation side. And we were having the conversation around how pessimistic it can look, how bad things are out there right now, stateside and globally. And towards the end, we did get into that conversation around what what can we actually do to make an impact to start finding some solutions. And he instantly tied it back to the American man, that the, the American man needs to drive Satan out of his household. The American Amen. man needs to stand up for his wife and daughters. The American man needs to stand up for women in his country and in his community. And that is the solution because human trafficking is, by the time that happens, it's triage. And so mm -hmm. the ripple effects of how we got that far are so far back. And he connected it to men stepping up. I guess my my question to kick things off or do you see do you agree? And then what are you seeing out there in terms of like current state American man? Um wow. I mean it's pretty abysmal, you know. Uh, every time the enemy wanted to shut down a move of God, he tried to take out a generation of men. I mean, see, like as Moses is coming along and the Pharaoh's trying to stop a move of God or Herod trying to stop what he knows is going to be a king that's going to usurp him. And so the enemy's done a really good job uh, in so many ways. Um, in fact, I'm working on it. I just had a book come out last week called Run Over by the Grace Train. It's about the gospel. But next year in October, I'll be releasing my fourth book called Stand Firm and Act Like Men, uh, which is mm -hmm. right out of uh, the book of Corinthians, where the Bible tells us to stand firm, be strong in the faith, be watchful, act like men, and let everything you do be done in love. That word stand firm is a Bible word that means fight. Like when mm -hmm. the military talk about standing up an army, that's what this means, or stand your ground. And, you know, uh we live in a world right now where gender is under attack and make no mistake about it. An attack on gender is an attack on the character and nature of God because it was his idea to make us male and female. And we reflect the character and nature of God differently as males and females. But the Lord is a warrior and the Lord is his name. And men have been created in his image to provide, to protect, to be prophet, priest and servant king. And when you, when the world begins to call those things toxic, it is, it's a demonic attack. Like our war, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, man. There's an enemy out there, like an actual enemy. And just because the enemy is spiritual doesn't mean he's not actual. Like he's an actual real enemy. And he's not just trying to trip men up. He's trying to kill, steal, and destroy you and everything mm -hmm. good and godly in your life. And he's not just, he wants to tear your head off, put it on a silver platter, put it at the gate of the city, and then brag about it. And mm. if you and I have been created by God to stand firm, to be watchful, that means to watch out or to stand watch. And so if the enemy can take you and I out, then by definition, our wives and children and communities are defenseless. And so that's who a man is. The two extremes is where we get into trouble. Right. So then it takes like I was in Kenya, Africa uh, one summer as a missionary there, like in my seminary days. And I got introduced to the Maasai tribe, you know, mm -hmm. the guys that like lion hunt and these are bad dudes, man. And I, I was the only one in my class that they would allow to go inside of the their village because they considered me a warrior, but nobody else, which is about right. Because seminarians ain't there ain't no warriors among them. Mm -hmm. And they asked me they were they were. Um, they were going through their ritual when they were declaring boys men and they would go out into the bush for it's about six weeks and you could only eat what you kill. And um, either you didn't make it back or if you made it back, you were a man. And Damn. the guy asked me, so when is a boy a man in your culture? I was like, dude, no we, manhood ceremonies. 
Right, man. I mean, depends on who you ask, right? Obamacare says 26. Like, you can be on your mama's insurance when you're 25. Uh, you know, Budweiser says 21. The, the U.S. military says 18. The DMV says 16. I mean, there there is no passage. And it takes a man to bestow manhood on an upcoming generation. And since we don't know what it is, we got a bunch of boys trying to declare other boys as men, which what it, it just makes them consumers. So whoever can drink the most or drive the biggest truck or shoot the biggest elk or bench press the most or whatever, man, CrossFit the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that has nothing to do with being a man. Now, I'm a man. I love to hunt and fish. My favorite color is camo. I love college football. I got more guns than I have fingers. I, I have a couple on me right now. It does not make me a man. It makes me awesome, but not a man. You, mm -hmm. you know, you could be a poet sitting at your hipster coffee shop, drinking your latte, reading poetry, and you could be a man, theoretically. So one extreme is just this, like, machoism that has nothing to do with God-given responsibility. Then the other extreme is we're just all the same. That's what the culture is teaching us today. And it's a lie. So you got men beating up women and calling it an Olympic sport. This is this is crazy. Crazy. And then the church hasn't been a lot of help in the last 50 years. Because what most churches have said, hey, fellas, come on in and act like women. Like, sit down, sit in circles. We're going to talk about our feelings. You can put on a robe and sing in the choir. And it's a real shame. So there's a bunch of us, man. You know, you mentioned Kyle earlier. He's he's on the front edge of this. But there's a bunch of churches waking up to say that we need to disciple men to be real men, especially where there's a manhood crisis. And it's mm -hmm. not about being a consumer. It's about taking responsibility, being a defender and a protector. And we've got to learn how to be tough for and tender with. And we learn it from Jesus. He's the lion mm -hmm. and the lamb. When it was time to be tough, he was tough. Nothing tougher than taking three nails on the cross and paying your sin debt. And then mm -hmm. he was also tender. Little kids wanted to come hang out with him, you know? Yeah. And so that's what it means to be man. The only way you can stand firm and act like a man is to bend your knee to Jesus, the perfect God man. And he in you can help you be the man God has called you to be. You know, you mentioned human trafficking. We partner with the Tim Tebow Foundation. Timmy's a member here at 1122. <laughs> and, um, one of the things we try to do when other people have a great ministry, instead of us trying to create something new, we just partner with ministries that already exist. Yeah. And so Timmy fights, they fight really hard against human trafficking and sex trafficking and child exploitation. In fact, he was just in DC getting a bill passed last week. Mm -hmm. And so we partner with him in a very, very significant way. So a part of every dollar like if you bring a dollar to God through the church of 1122, our church knows a part of your dollar funds a group of men and women with a very specific skill set that kicks down doors in conjunction with local police forces around the world and in America. Here's the cries of these kids that are getting raped and abused saying, dear God, please help me. And mm -hmm. we stand up a group of people that goes and not only rescues them, but put the evil doers in prison where they belong. So, man. And we make no apologies about it. People mm -hmm. are like, what? You buy guns? Yeah, we do all those things, man. Yes, we fully fund. We're buying vehicles and we're equipping these men and women and for what they need. And if you don't like it, no problem. But I promise I promise. who likes it is that little kid crying out. You know, there's this old preacher story. Um, and it's silly and it's cheesy, but it is really, really true. And the, the story goes, there's a guy walking down the seashore and there's you know a thousand starfish have washed up on shore and one by one he's throwing them back and somebody taps him on the shoulder it's like you're never going to make a difference you'll never get to all of them and he says it makes a difference to this one yeah and so you know to anybody that is fighting against an enemy and it seems like well what difference could i make well you know for that individual kid that family that person you're making and it, an incredible difference, an incredible difference. So we don't let what we may not be able to do stop us from what God may allow us to do. Yeah, we can't be scared of a fight that may never end. Right. We, we got to get in there. Yeah, it's not going to end until Jesus returns, but we are called to fight. Let's un unpack it a little bit more of current state. Do you think that with where things are at, is it 
a, a strategic spiritual plan to to take down America morally because you can't really take us down military wise you can't take us down economically so a lot of what we're seeing is the spiritual warfare but it's also it's specific the enemy knows what he's doing and so it's a, a demoralization of of men well if you look at ephesians 6 uh paul warns the church at ephesus that our battle is not against flesh and blood and then as he lists out who we're fighting against, the demonic, it almost sounds like military rank, the way he describes it. Well, here's the thing, man. When we think, when me and you think warfare, oftentimes the average American man's mind goes to like World War II. There's like mm. the good guys, the bad guys, they line up and we'll see who wins. Um, that cannot be the way it is between us and the enemy, because if you read to the end of the book, the battle is won, it is finished. The dragon has a mortal head wound. He's done. Okay. So very similarly to all the people that hate us as Americans, they can't just line up on the border of Canada and attack. It'd be over in one second, right? We just squish America. It's over. Yeah. So what has to happen is what we see all the time, these dirty war campaigns, these misinformation campaigns, the way bot farms influence algorithms to get the worst thing in your feed so that people that don't look like you and think like you, you begin to hate them, right? It's a misinformation campaign in the mind. This is primarily how the how the enemy is attacking us. And he mm -hmm. primarily wants us to doubt three things about God. He wants us to doubt the word of God. That's where he starts. I mean, look in the garden. The devil comes up and says, did God really say? He wants us to doubt the worth of God. If God really loved you, wouldn't he change your circumstances to the way you wanted them? He's not worthy of your worship. And then he wants us to doubt the work of God. You are the work of God. He wants to doubt yourself in regards to being created by God. He also wants you to doubt yourself in regards to being a work, a finished work of Jesus at the cross. When Jesus says it is finished, did it really count for you? So you go to church and you hear a message and you think, well, that's probably for all these church folks, but that doesn't count for me. The demoralization of the American man, I think, is just a fruit of the fact that we we removed our roots from being a God-fearing society a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, man, so I'm 51 years old. It was in my generation that the predominant narrative on how every person got here in school is you're nothing but a cosmic accident and you're nothing but a super evolved animal. And then you give it a generation and we wonder why people are acting like animals. Well, it's because mm. that's what you've told them they are. And so now you do see a bit of the pendulum swing. Some of the smartest people alive and podcasters and all the famous people are like, wait a minute, there might actually be something to this creator-created thing because I'm not buying it that I'm just an accidental clump of cells that mm -hmm. also has purpose and life and love and there's something in me that knows I'm supposed to protect. And so, yeah, man, I mean, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and we've been pouring garbage into the soul of America for a long time now. And so that's mm -hmm. what we've got. Yeah, and it does seem like it got bad enough where there is a season of uh, enough is enough, not mm -hmm. on our watch, a, re a revival happening right now as we speak in the last six months, last year. Uh, there's a wake up with a lot of warrior men. A lot of warrior men are, are kind of waking up. Are you, are you feeling the same thing? Bro, we've baptized two th over 2,000 people at our church since May. And the majority of those are men. Here's what I think. You ever read Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis or familiar with it? I'm familiar with it. So, you know, in case your listeners aren't, the idea is there's this senior demon writing to a junior demon on what to do with his client who was a Christian, right? And so the junior demon's like, here's what I'm trying. And the senior demon's like, either, hey, good job, or try this, or that'll help, whatever. I think... I think in many areas, especially with Christian men in the church, the devil has overplayed his hand and just pissed off a lot of dudes, and they're more in the fight than ever. Mm. 
You know, for a long time, he was just trying to lull us to sleep with comfort. But now, dude, evil and the demonic is just on full display. It's crazy. So, like, how in the world did we go from William Wallace and John Calvin and John Wayne to bearded men in dresses mocking the Lord's table at the opening of the Olympics? There's some dudes going, this ain't it, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or you just not that I've ever watched the music award show, but I always catch the, you know, like the backlash the next few days on the news. And you've got people like Taylor Swift, who let's just be honest. OK, just this little country girl that can sing and some people like her. And she's like doing full on demonic acts on a stage. And I think there's a bunch of moms and dads going, wait, what a minute. I thought you were just saying breakup songs. What are you doing mm. here? And so I think the devil is getting, he's too cocky, he's too confident. And uh, I think there's, a, hopefully the church will rise up and exactly what you said, not on my watch. Or, mm. man, when countries like England are ahead of us on recognizing that the the mutilation of healthy tissue and little boys and little girls is probably not a good idea because they're confused. When America is behind them on that, we're in a bad spot, man, a really bad spot. And so I think uh, one of the reasons, the main, the number one reason I'm as bold in the pulpit as I am on some of these things, I'm not trying to be political, but when politics enter theology, you're in my lane now. So I'm just mm -hmm. going to teach what the Bible says. And the Bible is very clear that we've got to stand up for, the, for those without a voice. We've got to stand up for those that need help. God's got a special place in his heart for the widow and the orphan. Also, mm -hmm. in church history, boy, we sure are glad William Wilberforce did not check his politics at the door. He helped get slavery abolished. We 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 sure are glad Dietrich Bonhoeffer didn't just roll over as the Nazis were taken over like most of the German churches do. I mean, we sure are glad that Martin Luther King Jr., uh, because of his professed faith, said that the reason that people need to treat each other equally is because we're all equal in the sight of God because we're all image bearers of him. We celebrate him as a hero. So why is it not our turn to stand on the word of God and stand up for the defenseless who don't have a voice? Mm -hmm. I think the enemy's overplaying his hand. Hey guys, I did want to interrupt for a quick minute right here and let you know about some supplements I've been taking. I did shy away from supplements for a long time. I was always cautious about what they were made out of, where they were from, and who the team was behind the brands. But over the last couple of years, I've got to meet the team at Mountain Ops from top to bottom, and they are an amazing group of humans. I've got to know the CEO, Trevor Farns, really well, and he is a mission focused individual that cares about humans living a better quality of life so that they can have that abundant life. So over the last couple of years, he has helped me add some things that have changed the game for me. One of those things that I've added is creatine from Mountain Ops. It helps me maintain some muscle mass, but also it's a big, big player in cognitive function, one of the most researched supplements out there. Also, I've added reds, greens, and protein, all from Mountain Ops. What I found as a busy professional, always on the run, I do eat a whole foods diet for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but on the go, it's hard to get enough vegetables fruits and protein. So I've added that from Mountain Ops and it has significantly changed the game. I can feel it in my performance. I haven't got sick for a long, long time and I can certainly feel it in my mental clarity as well. The last thing I've added is the Mountain Tough Hydrate product for the backcountry for hunting season. When I'm in the hills, I do run short on those electrolytes. We even have a Mountain Tough flavor, the Mountain Tough Lemon Lime Hydrate. And that is a game changer for hydration in the backcountry. So I keep it really simple. That is all I've added to my protocol. And it has certainly helped me. And I certainly believe in the team and the culture behind Mountain Ops. They have started an initiative that's been around for a while called Conquer Hunger. Conquer Hunger is giving meals to hungry kids that aren't getting enough food. And they've given out over 6 million meals plus two kids through their Conquer Hunger initiative. So every order that happens at Mountain Ops 
A percentage of that order goes to Conquer Hunger. So certainly an incredible company, an incredible culture. As a listener to the show, you do get an exclusive offer to Mountain Ops, so make sure you check that out. The offer is incredible as a first-time purchase at mountainops.com. So build your order if it's your first time. They are offering you a 20% exclusive discount. All you need to do is enter the promo code MOUNTAINTOUGH, all one word, all caps, for 20% off your first order at mountainops.com. You've been listening to the Mountain Tough Podcast. How come so many pastors are scared to to get into this stuff and talk about these issues? I mean, we... Yeah, we, it's a good we question. Know, it's a really good question. And I, I'm not trying to beat up every pastor. It'd be so easy for me to do that, especially on your show about being yoked and working and killing elk, okay? Like, I probably <laughs> got a... Like, my crowd is listening right now. You know what I mean? They're like, get them. Yeah. I think there's a lot of reasons. I don't think they're very well equipped to do it. Um fear is probably the number one reason and if there's a pastor listening please hear me spirit is not a feeling spirit is is a a, a fear is not a fear is not a feeling fear is a spirit paul tells timothy god didn't give you a spirit of fear but a power and of love and of self control so we need we need courageous pastors i don't think guys are necessarily very well equipped they don't know how to do it they're good at teaching the bible but there's not a, there's not a chapter in the Bible on exactly how to talk about transgenderism in 2024, so they mm. need to get equipped for it. Um, I think the the people in the pews in the churches could help encourage their pastors, saying, "Hey, man, say what you need to say, preach the word, and we've got your back. We know that the arrows are going to fling from the people sitting around us in here, but we've got mm. you." So like, for example, Amendment 4 is coming to Florida this fall. It's an abortion amendment to change the Constitution of Florida so that there could be abortion for any reason up to the point of birth without parental consent, and any health provider could offer it. it, it it's an amendment of genocide. And it's mislabeled. Like the title of it, if you and I didn't know what it said, we would vote for it. Because it says something like limiting government intervention in abortion. And you're like, yeah, who doesn't want that? Okay. But it's a freaking lie from the devil. So I stood on stage three weeks ago and hammered it like a nail. Part of the reason I'm doing this is because I want every other pastor in Florida. The primary reason I'm doing it is because I got to preach the truth, man. And I got to protect life. But I also think that boldness is uh, contagious. And if I go first and even give some words and language to some other pastors, then feel free to use all my words. We were, we were in a spiritual warfare series, and when we talked about the shield of faith, I talked about how the Roman soldiers fought, and they would link their shields together, not only to protect yeah. yourself, but to protect your brother and on your right and left. And if anybody fell, then they would cover the weakest and most vulnerable with their shields. And these babies can't speak up for themselves, and we must be the church that links our shields together to protect these babies. And mm. so I also think your average guy going into ministry ain't me and you, bro. I mean, I went Different. to seminary. It's the youth group kid whose favorite thing to do is, you know, read and play video games and not mm. outside. And so just kind of the, and which we need those pastors. I mean, they're all the smartest ones that write the best books and help dummies like me make sure I'm teaching the truth so I can read their commentaries. <laughs> but they're not necessarily the the guys out front leading. So this is why I think we all need each other. You know, it's one body with many parts. And um, I don't mind being the front line guy taking the shots if it helps all of the churches just come along. I mean, you know, if you look at World War II, let's, let's say there were about 18,000 churches uh, in and around Germany when Hitler is rising up. About 3,000 of them stood against Hitler. Hmm. About 3,000 stood with him because they got political benefit. But about the 12,000 in the middle didn't do anything because they said, you know, this is, this is out of our lane. Like, we're just going to teach Bible verses and we're not going to do anything about it. Crazy. If those churches in the middle would have fought against evil, 
tens of millions, not just the six million Jews that were killed, but tens of millions of lives would have been saved and he would have been shut down. So I just, I don't want to, I don't want to look back and say, and I don't want God to look at me one day and be like, brother, Bro, I told you yeah. as clear as I know how to tell you in first Corinthians 16, stand firm, be watchful, act like men. What were you doing? Mm. And so I, I'm ready to go to war. If your pastor isn't standing up, the other thing too is this, man, you can't like preach the Bible in one hand and like the latest news feed in the other because everybody's got their little pet project. Yeah. But when it comes to things like life, when it comes to things like marriage, when it comes to things like sexual immorality, it, it's not like the Bible hints at these things. It is explicit on what God's people ought to be doing. Now, I'm not preaching sermons on taxation or what I think about yep. free speech. You know what I mean? And bro, I have yep. my opinions for sure. But yep. but I if you preach the word of God, I don't know how you don't how you, how you don't fight for what is right in regards to God's eyes, particularly in America where our founders said we know that the rights that we have, we didn't make up in a back room and they were approved by this government. We know that these rights are self-evident and they come from our creator, God. And so I, I hope and pray that some men are filled with some, you know, a courageous spirit to stand firm, stand up, fight and act like men. Let's get into that a little bit, because I would did go through your series on spiritual oh, warfare and I really enjoyed it, but it. I wanted to start with with that first one because the series went through this is war, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the, the gospel, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, and prayer is warfare. Because I think it is helpful on today's conversation to get into some practical things men can start doing on the daily to start making an impact on their household and the country, because it is easy to be pessimistic for an hour on a podcast right now with everything that's going on mm -hmm. and how, how blatant the enemy is attacking us. But I, I would love to spend some time on, on practical things, but I, I think we should start with this as war. Cause I think, the way that you articulated what spiritual warfare is, that was super helpful for me. Yeah. The first thing that you have to know, I, again, I think there's two extremes here. Some people think there's like, you know, the devil behind every bad bow shot. And maybe you just need to practice more, bro. <laughs> but the other extreme is if you don't know there is a devil at all, that he's trying to kill you, you're screwed. Mm. And um, like, listen, you know, I love to hunt more. I mean, I love it probably too much i do always think it's a kind of funny that they call what we do a sport i mean i know it's an outdoor hard activity but you know in a sport both teams know when the game starts in our sport half the teams don't know we're playing yet this is why we win because they don't even know you know like it's out there I, that's why i always win i don't always get one but they don't ever get me well mm-hmm Dude, if you go, if you wake up every day and don't realize that there is an apex predator called the devil trying to kill, steal, and destroy you, you're screwed, man. You're going to be like that deer walking up to the corn feeder and he has no idea that, you know, Bubba's in the tree 15 feet up with his bow drawn. And um, that, we're like, you know what a sucker punch is? That's when you didn't know somebody was swinging and you get hit. If you don't oh, realize no. you're at war, you're the sucker because the enemy's trying to kill you. And so, that's the beginning of it, is that we are at war. The devil's vision statement is in our Bible. The thief, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That is the only thing he's trying to do. He may do this through temptation and sin. He may do this through laziness. Here's what's crazy. He doesn't care how he gets you. He just wants to get you. Like, you go fishing. Do you care what lure you use? No, you just want to catch fish. So he doesn't yeah. care how he gets us. 
his three primary lures, according to First John, is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So a big question, fellas, for you to ask yourself is, if you were the devil, how do you think you would take you out? Lust of the eyes is about stuff, you know? And and you think you're going to be more satisfied as soon as you get that new whatever, that new truck, that new house, that new lease, whatever it is. Hmm. And stuff isn't stupid. We're stupid because we put our hope in stuff. <clears throat> Lust of the flesh is about sex, sensuality. It means I want to feel a certain way. And it could be pornography, but it also could be Pop-Tarts. Like you're self-medicating with crappy, sugary foods because it just makes you feel good in the moment. And then the pride of life, it's about status. Like I'm going to be the man. I'm going to, people going to do what I say. Well, here's the thing. It is like a lure when you go fishing. Every lure has a hook. So if you were the devil, how would you take you out? I mean, the reason that you and I can kill an elk is because we have some idea of what elk do in September. Yeah. Lust so of the flesh. Right. So they're beatable because they're predictable. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the devil's beatable because he's predictable. He's been throwing those three lures since the Garden of Eden. So how, if you were him, how would he, how would you take you out? War against that, get you some brothers around you and tell them, ask me these things about me because the enemy is trying to kill my marriage, my family, my career. And if I were him, here's what I would do to me to try to take me out. It's war. Mm. Or how about this one, bro? The Bible says that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. All right. I don't know where your studio is, but if you knew that an actual lion was after you today, you would walk to your truck differently. <laughs> you wouldn't just casually walk out of your truck. You'd get to the door and be like, anybody seen a lion? Like you would, you would prepare, yep. right? Well, that's yep. how we need to wake up every day and be prepared. I think it's helpful for guys to also understand how patient and how long the devil will work on this stuff. He'll spend 80 years trying to take you out. He's not spending eight weeks trying to take you out. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, he, yeah. I mean, he, uh, yeah. His, his time frame is not the same as our short, instant gratification world that we're used to living in. Yeah, as a, a friend of mine named Josh Howerton, he said in this series, he was preaching for me here, and he said, the birthmark of the Christian is a bullseye. So I would say this too, if you haven't blooded your nose lately because you've been bumping up against this evil culture, it could be because you're just going with the flow. And so pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should expect persecution. Yeah, no doubt. So after identifying that we're in this war, we don't need to go through the entire series, but recapping after we understand and we know the war that we're in, we, we understand the devil is prowling around us like a lion 24-7. Right. What are some other things we can do to move forward in the correct way. So if you if you look at Ephesians 6, I mean, if you want to go listen to it online, coe22.com, and all my sermons are there for free. You know, it took us nine or 10 hours to get through it all, so I can't do it in the next five minutes. But it basically starts, like, when you put on the full armor of God, so it's like, I know I'm at war, I know I've got an enemy, suit up. It starts out with this is who you are. The breastplate of righteousness is if you know Christ, he has placed his approval on you. The helmet of salvation is because he's attacking you in the mind. He doesn't want you to know you're safe. The shoes fitted with the readiness of the gospel. You have a mission. And the mission is not just your comfort. The mission is how is God going to use you to get this message to the ends of the earth? So, I mean, honestly, bro, you're a great example of this. So the point of Mountain Tough is not to be Mountain Tough. Mountain Tough is a vehicle to people to be eternally tough and know Jesus. And meanwhile, you're leveraging this thing that you love, which is hunting and fitness. And you're just saying, yeah. okay, I've I've put on these shoes to be ready that as I'm living my life, I'm trying to share the gospel. That's your purpose. You're not just fighting aimlessly. Mm. And then he gets to the sword of the spirit, prayer, and preaching boldly. This is how we are to be offensive against the enemy. 
So you better be rooted in the word of God. That's what the sword of the spirit is. That's also the best way to deflect the attacks of the enemy. So when the enemy lies to you, you got to identify the lie. And Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So identify the lie that you're believing from the enemy. Take off the old, put on the new. So like if you've ever refletched your arrows, what do you do? You don't just add fletchings to the arrow. It'd be goofy. It wouldn't fly right. You have six <laughs> fletchings all, it'd be dumb. First, yeah. you got to take off the old ones because they're steering you in the wrong direction. That's what a lie of the enemy does. You put on the new ones. This is what we do with the word of God. So when Jesus was tempted in the desert all three times, and by the way, the enemy came at him with lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And Jesus says, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so we fight him with the word of God. Secondly, we fight him with prayer. Prayer is the power source to the Christian. I'm telling you, man, it's the cam on your bow. It ain't just the string and the arrow. But without the cam on your bow, your arrow has no power. And so prayer is the power source to connect us to Almighty God. And he may change your circumstances. I've prayed for people that have cancer and they got healed. Or he may just mm -hmm. decide to strengthen you in your circumstances. That's up to him. That's the power. And then lastly, the thing that Paul asked for is you proclaim the mystery of the gospel. That if you move away from the gospel, you're moving away from the Lord. You got to consistently preach the gospel to yourself over in your marriage, as your dad, when you, in your vocation, you got to consistently say, God created me to have a relationship with me. Sin broke that. Christ would love me enough that he would come on a rescue mission for me. And when he mm -hmm. saved me, he's going to take me all the way there to be with him. And he, and he doesn't regret saving me. And when I can, when I can know that the verdict comes first, then I can perform. If I think my performance determines the verdict, I'm screwed. And men mm -hmm. fall to that trap all the time. Yeah. Yeah, with good works rather than just understanding their salvation and living in that that peace and then finding their assignment after that. Right. That's in, that's incredible incredibly helpful and then how how critical is it with all of this? And it, I know it's closely tied into the shield of faith. Yeah. But where does having like a band of brothers around you, some some men of wisdom that'll speak into your life that you're living life with, like where do you rate that on a one out of ten to to having success on this journey? Ten. You can't do it alone. So Paul is writing the the book of Ephesians from jail, he's probably looking at a Roman soldier and he's thinking about some verses from Isaiah when he comes up with this, you know, Ephesians six, Rome took over the world because they fought together. I think it's the Spartans that invented the shield wall, but the Romans perfected it. And you will never, ever, listen, being a Christian is not an individual sport, man. You're not supposed, you can't do this alone, that we are, you are a part of a body. So like if you were walking to your truck again after we finished talking and you just saw a severed foot, you would not look at that foot and be like, well, that's fine. Who am I to tell that foot? It's got to be a part of the body. You would think this is gross. You would also know the future of the foot. It's over for the foot, man. It's going to shrivel up, stink and die because it's not a part of the body. You would also know there's some body out there that really wishes they had their foot. And you and I are supposed to be a part of the body of the faith family. And so one of my favorite places of this is in Mark chapter two. There's a man that's paralyzed and he's got four friends and they each grab a corner of this mat and they bring that dude to Jesus. And they love this guy so much that when the house is full, they tear a hole in the roof and they drop this paralytic man down. And think about this. Jesus, the Bible says Jesus sees the faith of the friends and then says to the man, your sins are forgiven. So the That's question, cool. yeah. So do you have friends that will do whatever it takes to get your butt to Jesus? You better be able to write down four men's names right now. And if you can't, mm -hmm. you're not doing it right. And if you're like, well, I don't have those kind of men. That's bull crap. If you wanted a new rifle, you figure it out. If you wanted a new mm -hmm. truck, you'd figure it out. So this is why you should be involved in a church. This is the best place to find these kind of men. And the first step is be those kind of men. 
Like, who can you actually talk to when you're frustrated at home and you don't know what to do? Or who is actually praying for you? And don't say your mom because you don't tell her the truth. You lie to her all the time. Like, who mm -hmm. is actually praying for you? Who is the kind of man that when you really needed something with your kids, you could call them? Like, you had Kyle on. Kyle talks about your the 3 a.m. friends versus the 6 p.m. Yep. friends. Right. Yep. I call these Matt carriers. Matt Chandler calls them the king's table. Uh, Kyle calls them foxhole brothers. Do you have these kind of men in your life? And here's what's really important, man. Do you have the kind of men in your life that love you more than they love what you think about them? Like if you're being a punk to your wife, do you have the kind of men that would say, hey, dude, not cool. That's not how we're going to do it here. You know, show her a little more grace. Um, They'll call you out. Yeah, dude, they would love you enough like iron sharpens iron. Like, what? We'll, okay, if we go sight in our rifles, what good does it do if we're standing there at the range and you're three inches right at 100 yards? And I go, ah, close enough. When well, you're going to make that 600-yard shot, you're screwed. Mm, yeah. Dude, that's partly my responsibility if we're, if I, if you're actually my guy, right? Mm -hmm. And so a big part of what you do is you're just inviting people into your life, saying, if you see me off target, well, you have permission. I'm asking you to help me get my life sighted in on what Christ has for me. It's also easier to hear than the people that just want to volunteer it that you didn't invite in. So <laughs> invite those people in, man. And the best way to find them is start, like, be one. Be that kind of guy mm -hmm. for somebody. Mountain Tough is the fitness app trusted by the dedicated. Mountain Tough ethos is backed by... We've always wanted to be the best in the world at helping our customers become more mentally tough. So inside the Mountain Tough app, you're not only gonna find all of our physical training programs, but you're gonna find additional training as well so that you can stay sharp physically, mentally, spiritually, and nutritionally. The Mountain Tough app also allows you to train no matter where you are anytime anywhere additionally the mountain tough app is going to have programs from beginners all the way up to elite athletes and all of our programming is structured in a way that you can start with no gear at body weight and you can go all the way up to programming that is full gear so you can do that in a robust home gym or your local gym. There's no excuse for you not to start today. With Mountain Tough, you can conquer your goals with ideal program for your lifestyle and schedule. Train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. Most importantly, Mountain Tough will help you train your mindset so you are always ready for anything life throws your way. Mountain Tough is offering the Mountain Tough podcast listeners an incredible offer. Six weeks free on the Mountain Tough app. All you need to do is use the code MTNPOD to redeem your six weeks of training. That'll be a 14 day free trial plus a whole additional four weeks of training. Just go to mountaintough.com and enter code MTN. P O D for your six weeks free on the best in class physical and mental training app. You've been listening to the mountain tough podcast. Yeah. And that parable is so helpful too, because it, it shows the extreme you need to go through to bring someone to Jesus. I mean, tearing off the roof of a house is not easy. They they probably didn't have a jackhammer in their pocket, and it's loud, and it's uh, embarrassing. It's frustrating. Like, just dropping some dude through a roof is very, not very like expensive. a super easy thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, and for all the church people out there, the people that already had a seat, they were the one that's, that got most disrupted. So I sure do hope and pray you're at the kind of church that's willing to tear the roof off for one more person to get to Jesus. And you're more concerned about that than if you get your seat and if you get your parking spot. Men should be the kind of men that are the first ones to at great discomfort to themselves do what it takes to get more people to Jesus. That's financially. Mm -hmm. That's in regard to, the, to their time, their effort. Yeah. 
When you think about some men at your church, some men that you're close to at 1122, you think about some of them that are crushing it on this Christian walk. What a, what do their lives look like? Man, a um, couple of my guys that come to mind, two of my Matt Carriers, one of them's a guy named Jeff Kopp. Uh, he actually played in the NFL. He was a linebacker for six years and uh, here, in the, here for the Jags. But that still does not define him. He got saved at our church maybe like eight years ago or something. And this guy just pursues Jesus first and foremost. And then you can see it in his life. And, dude, he's a man's man. Like, I mean, obviously, if you play linebacker in the NFL, you know, I mean, you're a dude, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, since he got saved, he's become a pastor at our church. He lives his whole life. He loves his family. He's a provider and a protector. And he's bold about sharing the gospel. Uh, another guy named Charles Martin, who I write books with, Big time hunter. We hunt a lot together. And just first and foremost, his life is aimed at Jesus. And then you see it play out in the way he loves his wife and he's, and he's raising his boys and the way he lives his whole life. That These are the kind of men that I want to be around. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, man, I'm just telling you, like, Dustin, if me and you became, you know, if you moved to Jacksonville and we started hanging out all the time, if if six to eight months after we were hanging out, if your wife didn't say, you know what, you're a better husband, better dad, better employee, then then my group isn't doing it right. Yeah. So we we've just changed the focus of what a win is in our crowd, you know. And dude, we have more fun than anybody. Okay, it's not like we just get together and pray and do Bible study every day. It's not what we're doing, man. We're just doing the thing. Living. We hunt a lot, but but what we're trying to do is just set. The biblical standard for manhood is what we're aiming at, and we're trying to help each other with the help of Christ because we screw up all the time and we need the grace of Jesus. But that's what we're aiming at. We're trying to help each other aim at that. And so oh. that's in the area of finances. It's in the area of fitness. It's in the area of the way we love our families. It doesn't really – all of that is like – well, it's like when you get when you get the flu – the flu infects you and it gives you symptoms. Yeah. When you get infected with the gospel, there should be some serious symptoms in your life, the way you work, the way you treat your family, the way you take care of your body. And so we're trying to make sure we're consistently infected with the gospel so that the symptoms of our life show it. Fruit. Yeah. You're seeing the fruit. Yeah. Are you seeing some dudes execute well on, manhood ceremonies for young men yeah we did one with my son jp who we just sent to college and we made it like a four and a half year thing that built on itself every year and then it culminated last year with uh two events one and they were all hunts for me that's where it started so he was like 14 years old and i took him on a, a little deer hunt and then uh this last year, I took him to South Africa, and he bow hunted. He killed four animals. So in Africa, we did a thing, like the tribe that we're with, who are Christians now. And mm -hmm. then I just, the biggest thing is I got the men, honestly, it's mostly the guys that he grew up with, his coaches, some of the men in my life that have been around him. They just wrote some things out and spoke this truth over him. And... uh and I don't know, oh, your your audience will be fine with this. Yeah. And instead of giving him like an engraved sword or something that would be on the, you know, be on the wall that you couldn't use, I, I gave yeah. him an AR-10 and a bench made knife that he could actually use both of them, you know? That's and, awesome. Um, yeah. And, and it wasn't even a surprise. I, he knew that was coming if he grew into the kind of man that God has called him to be. And mm -hmm. we're not done. So we're going to continue that father-son hunt trip every year. Uh, as, and then I want to do another thing like when he graduates from college, you know? And because I don't think you ever, it's not just like a ceremony. The ceremony things are cool. The biggest thing you're trying to do is just give them a peg to hang some memories on of how my dad showed me what it's like to be a man and how the community has said, 
welcome to the club. You're in. You're mm-hmm. one of us. Now we never stop growing and we never stop training and we never stop. I mean, think about this. The most simple definition of being a disciple is following Jesus. I mean, that's what he said, right? Follow me. Okay. If you stop taking steps, you are by definition no longer following. You're just standing mm-hmm. still. And so we want to just continuously take that next step of obedience. So it's not like that ceremony is over. It just had some significant parts in it throughout his life. That's awesome. Yeah, it's just so so big because if if a young man doesn't know that, they can spend a long time wondering if they're a man because there's no defining moment when that conversation took place. Correct. And now that he's 18 and he's in school, he's got his own place, he's in Tallahassee. Um, I even make sure that even, even if he's like, Hey dad, I got this question about this or whatever. Uh, I just constantly try to say, bro, you're a man and you have to take responsibility. I'm here to give you any advice that you ask for, but you're a man. You got to act like a man and do as small as this, this might be silly. I, I don't know. I feel like your crowd will like this. So, First time he's ever lived on his own. He's got three roommates. They got these three raccoons that are busted into their trash every night. And I'm like, what are you going to do about it? And he, so he sent me a picture today and he sprinkled some frosted flakes out there. And he's got like one of those high power pellet guns, you know, and he just, he just sat it out and he just texted me. All it says easy pickings. And you see this video of the trash (laughs) and then they're going to relocate the raccoon. Just sniping. Dude, it's awesome. And then what part of what's great though, he's like, dude, none of my roommates could do that. Like it wouldn't occur to them. And it was mm-hmm. his first instinct. And I'm like, dude, that's because uh, I raised you to be a grown man. And you mm-hmm. just got to figure some stuff out and take responsibility and just do stuff. And yeah. you can't. I think one of the biggest problems with men today, especially in our comfortable society, is we always, uh, and this is the worst with the government. We always think there's some number that we're supposed to call for somebody else to come and solve one of our problems. Try to, if you can do it, you should do it. Solve it. Yeah. Just solve it. Figure it out, man. Now, again, if you're making bank and and you're going to focus your time and energy on another thing because you got people to do that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about who's going to help the raccoons. Who's going to help you keep the raccoons out of your trash? You better figure that out. (laughs) And so he's figuring it out, which is great. It's so funny. My my wife is like, it's so weird what you get excited about. He's also got straight A's. And I'm like, yeah, who? Do, so many people have straight A's. I don't care. But Yeah, he's killing raccoons. <laughs> Dude, it's awesome, man. <laughs> it's also funny because he's like, Dad, I got so nervous. I was, he's like, you know, he's, and he's killed a bunch of animals. I was like, bro, I don't care what the target animal is. When it shows up, I get buck fever like you. And it could be a 400-inch elk. Or it could be a doe that I'm just trying to fill the freezer with, man. I get like <laughs> tore up. Oh, so. that that heart just beating in your earlobes. No it's doubt. crazy. It's the best. <laughs> well, Joby, we're we're running out of time. I had one final thing I wanted you to hit us on in closing, because I think that it is destroying so many men and and so related to everything we talked about today, but. What are you, what are you preaching at eleven twenty two on the, on the porn stuff with men and and how it's just wrecking life after life after life. Here's the thing, man. When it comes to porn, first of all, so tips and tricks and tactics are very important. Okay, download the software, get accountability, all of these things. They're very important. Don't be a fool. Um. So I'll go secondary first. Jesus says, if your eye causes you to lust, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to, he says right hand. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That sounds like a porn Mm. problem, doesn't it? Mm. And if you hear that and you're like, well, that's extreme. Jesus is saying, this is extremely dangerous. It's going to kill you, man. You think it's just pictures. You're actually contributing to human slavery. Do you realize that? You're, I mean, the amount of damage you're doing, not only to your own marriage and your own soul, but to other families is it's hard to even describe. So do whatever it takes. If you if your problem is your phone, 
throw your freaking phone in the ocean and get a dumb phone. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. If your problem is your laptop, throw it in the ocean and figure out something else to do. If you're flirting with some girl at work that's not your wife, get another job. Gouge out your eye, cut off your hand. Do whatever it takes because your life, your wife's life, the life of your children is on the line. I cannot express how dangerous this is. And yet, none of the outward tactics are ever going to do it. If you don't, if Jesus is not preeminent in your life, if he's not first and most in your life, if, if he's not more beautiful, more lovely, more attractive than anything else in your life, then you're going to fill your life with all kind of little G gods that will, that are just going to fail you. So the primary mm. way to fight porn is abide in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the primary way. And then you also need the secondary things around you. You need brothers around you where you where you are and where they don't put up with it. I think a bunch of accountability groups are bullcrap because they put up with it. Hmm. Guys like, well, I looked at porn again. I was like, oh, well, what are you going to do? No, man, shut up. When are we telling your wife? That'll stop you. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we got to have some real ramifications here because Christ died on a cross to set you free of this sin. Hmm. So, again, all of us are susceptible to it. Every dude I've ever known at some point, if they're not in it, they have been at some point in your life, their life. And yet, I mean, I, and yet, I, because of a work Christ has done in my life, in addition to the things I put around my life, that's not a struggle for me. Hmm. Because eventually, like again, man, the devil's like a good bass fisherman, right? So he throws that lust of the flesh out there and jiggles it in front of you. And you turn it down enough, and eventually he's going to clip that lure off, and he's going to go in some other direction. Yeah, he'll try I would do new. whatever it takes. One of the things is you need some it is written. You better you better memorize First Corinthians six. All sins of man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Flee sexual immorality. That means run away from. If you've ever if you've ever looked at porn, it's because you flirted instead of fleed. That's right. You just decided, well, you know what? This Instagram account's fine. Quit Instagram, quit all your social media, whatever it takes. You should memorize Job 31.1. I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look lustfully after a woman. Tape it to your laptop if that's what you need to do. But you have to war. You, you got to go to war. And don't mm -hmm. tell me you can't. I, if you're listening to Mountain Tough, you're willing to go to war against your flat sobby self so you can climb a mountain and shoot an elk, which mm. is awesome. It's nothing compared to, to what the enemy wants to do to tear your marriage apart and tear you down spiritually. Yeah. So, so just like you're willing to get up every day and put on the weighted vest and hike that stupid hill that you hate and makes you feel terrible because you know of the reward, you do whatever it takes like, man, I had another guy in ministry this week found out, just disqualified himself from ministry, right? And I'm telling my wife, and we're sad, and we're angry. We've got a lot of emotion. Bro, the amount of freedom that I have because I can just, I just hand my wife my phone. We've been married, it'll be 25 years in February. And I say, baby, I have nothing to hide from you. Here, yeah. look at whatever you look. Look at every text, look at every email, search all my history, look at anything I follow on Instagram. You Here you go. Do you know what freedom there is in that? That joy, that peace. Bro, and then, and then she feels valued because she knows she doesn't have to share. And it just makes our marriage better and better and better and better. And that's what you want. So do whatever it mm -hmm. takes. War against it like you war against your body to get in shape for elk season. War ag against that's super helpful and, and it is how you started i think it's helpful for dudes to know how spiritual it is yako talked last week that they did a study where eighteen thousand kids that had repeating nightmares so they would have repeating nightmares weekly of some bad dude entering the house so these are little kids in a home having weekly or monthly nightmares, and it's the same nightmare each time. 
87 percent of those kids either the mom or dad was addicted to porn so they'd opened up the spiritual window yeah just like opening up the window and letting a burglar into your house yes yeah, demonic you know what i just learned two weeks ago i was i was preaching this men's conference with a guy named jim bergen at flatiron church he's a stud man yeah jim's awesome dude i love that guy so much he's like uh anyway so we're back we baptized i think 88 men at this uh rocky mountain men's summit and jim taught me i didn't know this somehow i didn't know this in the first century when you would get baptized they ask you two questions they would say who is jesus and you would confess him as your lord and savior like the new testament says you need to and then they would say and do you renounce all allegiances with the demonic or Satan, or his lies? Do you cut all ties in the visible and invisible realms with the devil? So not only were you claiming Jesus is my king, you were saying Satan, and you are not, and you have no hold on my house or my household any longer. I think that's mm -hmm. something that we've lost in the church. It's yeah. Jesus is not an add-on. If he's your king, then you have to renounce pornography. It's not just a simple matter of, I like to see naked people. No, bro. This is demonic. This is like a spirit of Jezebel trying to get inside your house to, to make sure that your children don't have healthy marriages. To make sure mm -hmm. that your, I'm, I'm just telling you, it opens a Pandora's box of the demonic in your house that you don't even know what you're messing with. Generational. Totally, 100%. Well, man, we're out of time. I I wanted to let you know just how helpful you've been in my life. And I think that's so awesome with like what you're doing. And I'm up here in Montana, 2000 miles away, but it's cool how, you know, God has used you to be a warrior for him, standing up for his word and how you've had no fear around that. And it, it's it's changing it's changing lives it's changed mm -hmm. mind and you're helping a lot of men and i appreciate you man man i appreciate that maybe i can get up to montana we can chase something around in the woods sometime yeah we'll get you up here dude i'd love it i mean seriously love it and i'm before we i don't know if that part is going to be on it but i'm about to download the app and do the four week because i got to get in shape for scotland hiking the <laughs> highlands yeah let's get you on that weight vest 20 dude let's go all right all right. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Peace. Peace. What an excellent episode with Joby. What a phenomenal human being. You can hear his heart for the Bible. You can hear his heart for following Jesus and ministering to men. He is a man's man, but he is walking the walk and talking the talk and Remember, every single episode, we're looking for that golden nugget. What can we take from today's conversation and apply to our lives today, this evening, tomorrow? Certainly, this one had a dozen or more golden nuggets in it when it comes to things you could apply to your life today. The big one that stood out for me is that group of brothers around you. Who do you have right now that'll call you out on stuff you're doing in your life? Who do you have right now that is going to grab you by the shoulder and tell you things to work on, things to change. They're going to bail you out. They're going to help you out all from a biblical foundation. If you don't have those guys, you need to find those guys right now. And no excuses. He's He did mention if you need a new scope next week, you're going to find a way to get a new scope. So if you need that brother in your corner that you do not have, Make sure that you put in the work to find that guy. And as he talked about, the best way to do that is to be that person for someone else. What a great conversation with Joby. I hope that gets you fired up. And we'll continue to bring you inspiring guests week after week. Love you guys, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Mountain Tough Podcast. We'll see you next week.